Okay. Right, yeah, I think in the spirit of um, keeping this fairly brief and quick and uh, allow us to get on to more interactive session, I'll, I'll go through my slides. Um, but I will you know, encourage you guys to think of questions, take advantage of our attendance whilst we're here, and uh, uh, let's get some interactive discussion going afterwards. So I'll talk about the uh, Offshore Safety Directive, which is obviously a very current hot, uh, hot topic. Refresh a little bit on the background as to uh, why we are where we are with the Offshore Safety Directive. A quick refresh on some of the key obligations on both industry and also the competent authority. It covers both dimensions. And I'll share some of the key, I was going to say highlights, maybe lowlights from the North Sea Transition Experience as well. We've been through this process and uh, I'm here to share some of those key learning points as well. So, but before I do, I think it's always nice to share um, a safety moment. So, this is one which maybe is forgotten in the midst of time, unfortunately. This is the Ocean Ranger incident from 1982 in Newfoundland. And uh, unfortunately, this was a semi submersible mobile offshore drilling unit that capsized in a storm. Um, the root cause of that was uh, a, a, an excessive wave height that basically smashed a porthole in one of the uh, stability columns. The ballast control centre room, the panels were located within a room which was about eight metres above the sea level. The wave height was 17 metres. So water ingress into that room, um, salt water ingress into electrical systems that controlled the ballast stability systems, uh, uncommanded valve spurious operations which uh, disrupted the stability of the vessel. It listed, water came in the chain locker and uh, the, the vessel was lost. And unfortunately, it was, it was in winter, and um, this all predates Piper Alpha and the use of immersion suits and uh, robust escape evacuation arrangements and such like. And the whole complement of the crew, 84 people, unfortunately lost their lives in, in that incident. Um, so, as with all major events, there was a combination of engineered safeguard failures and people failures as well, and how those... Uh, causes interact and fail and the reason for sharing this as well it's a good example of a major accident and it's this type of event which the offshore safety directive is, is particularly focused on managing um, so major accidents are the, the the large scale fires explosions major loss of stabilities where we could incur major loss of life so it's another facet of safety we're not saying uh, the more day-to-day -day routine occupational slip trips and uh, uh, type of safety is not important, of course it is, and we need to manage those. But the safety directive is, is focused on these, these, these catastrophic, very infrequent major accidents as well. Um, and the Ocean Ranger incident was characterised by both failures in prevention and mitigation as well, and those are two themes which are at the core of the directive. Okay, so just to recap, um, the safety directive introduces legislation to manage major accidents. It's focused on reducing the occurrence and reducing the likelihood or how often those um, catastrophic events could occur. It's also focused on making sure there are arrangements to limit the consequences of uh, those events, so the how bad. So because it considers the how often the how bad, that equals risk. It's a risk-based legislative regime. And it's what's called a goal-setting demonstration regime where the onus is, if I were an operator, the onus would be on me to provide a compelling demonstration to the competent authority that I understand, fully understand my major accidents, I uh, understand the required prevention and mitigation controls, and I have good, robust arrangements in place to make sure those controls are uh, fit for purpose and working. So risk-based goal-setting demonstration regime. We have to show the competent authority we are in control of our major accidents. Um, just a little bit of background from the uh, EU perspective. So this all came about because of Macondo. After Macondo, the EU did a range of reviews. Uh, they recognised there was a large portfolio of upstream offshore oil and gas operations in Europe, you know, approximately 500 installations. Um, they also recognised that... Uh, Following the Piper Alpha disaster, a range of practices and legislation was implemented, specifically focused on controlling major accidents. 
Um, there was many challenges that the EU recognised in terms of control of offshore major accidents, but the three areas of most concern to them were a, a, a fragmented, inconsistent legislative regime, which was non-existent in certain areas, um, recognising that the, the nature of the hazards and the consequences associated with major accidents may be transboundary in terms of oil spill, Therefore, the current regulatory flame framework did not provide effective response across country territorial watery boundaries. Um, and there was concerns around um, liability regimes. Who is actually the owner, the operator, who is, who is undertaking the activity, who is actually responsible uh, in the event of a major accident to pay for remediation, say. Um, Quickly going over the EU's sort of logic and thought processes. So, as with all new legislation, they did an impact assessment. They reviewed uh, a range of options. So the options uh, went from do nothing, which is clearly unacceptable in this day and age, all the way through to a centralised um, entity responsible for control of major accidents and safety in Europe. Um, but also recognising that the, the ability to implement that, given the nature of the member states in Europe, would be not practical. So they did uh, a review of the range of options that are available for the legislative regime and settled on what's called option two, which was basically take the North Sea legislation, add a few extra bits and pieces into it, and then uh, push that out as a directive around the member states. And initially it was going to be regulation around the member states, but there was a lot of kickback um, that potentially would have diluted certain legislative arrangements in the North Sea. So it was felt the best strategy was to implement as a directive, allowing member states to weave the requirements in and around their sort of current legislative re regime. Okay, um, this was um, some information from the impact assessment was performed by the EU, and it was one of their uh, piece of information that helped justify doing this, because obviously there's going to be a cost, but we want to see the benefit. So essentially what this, this graph is showing is the benefit to overall safety, let's say major accident safety and general occupational safety, but recognising you can't really think of safety in those terms. But in the North Sea, um, safety case regulations, SCR 92 was introduced in 92, various other sets of legislation were introduced, and what the data is showing that um, that awareness and, and focus on safety and focus on control of major accidents had a net benefit in reducing the overall uh, performance in terms of safety as well, LTI is reduced. Now interestingly, the converse is not necessarily true. When you look at say Macondo, Texas City, Piper Alpha, some of the other major events, they all had exemplary, let's say occupational LTIs. Um, at the time when they had their big event. So Macondo had a fantastic occupational safety record, but at the time the, uh, they, uh, they had the blowout, they, um, they had really, really good occupational safety. So it's maybe indicating that this is all about, most things in life, it's all about getting the balance right between occupational safety and major accident safety as well. Okay, um, quickly going through some of the key requirements of the directive. At the core is the requirement to prepare a report on major hazards also known as a safety case. As I mentioned before, this is a risk-based goal-setting uh, legislative regime. We need to demonstrate to the regulator, we know our major accidents, we understand the controls that are in place, and we have good management systems to keep those controls in place. That's a lot of information to be able to share with a regulator. We need a vehicle and a mechanism to allow us to do that. The, the, the mechanism to allow us to do that is the safety case document. So it pulls all this information, this evidence together to allow us to make that demonstration. Um, okay, quickly moving on. Some of the key requirements, uh, licensing requirements, we have to be able to demonstrate if, if we're an operator that we have the technical and financial capability to uh, undertake the, the activity we're planning. Uh, requirement to consult public, public um, who may be affected by the, the, the undertaking. Uh, the directive introduces the requirement for a competent authority to be form, performed who are independent of um, the organisation for the economic development and growth of the oil industry. 
Their role is to review the reports on major hazards, verify the HSE provisions are in place, uh, and of course, being a competent authority, they have the, the powers to enforce uh, actions and impose penalties, should those be required. Um, the directive introduces uh, a practice that came in the North Sea after Piper Alpha, which is the requirement for independent verification of those pieces of equipment which are considered critical. Um, these are now termed the safety and environmental critical elements, so things like the firing gas systems, emergency shutdown systems, escape evacuation rescue systems as well. Also a requirement for um, the well design and the well plans to be independently reviewed, and, and Felix will share more data on that after as well. Um, some of the expectations directed there's, there's transparency and knowledge sharing between operators to promote best practice and awareness of be best practice protection of whistleblowers, um, and there was also the reporting regulations that came out about a year after the directive, which require operators to report uh, incidents and also precursors to incidents in a structured, systematic format as well. So that is all about getting good data to allow the EU to track uh, the performance of the industry as a whole, but also maybe cast their eye back in 10 years' time to say this was all worth it because we we reduce the number of hydrocarbon leaks, say. Um, emergency response, won't say any more on that, that was talked about before. Uh, liability requirements for the operators to be fully liable in the event of a major accident. So, North Sea, we already had a range of legislative instruments in place after Piper Alpha. The directive um, was largely based on the North Sea, let's say it was 95% the same as the North, North Sea safety case regulations. So for us, it didn't really mean much change. We, we just had to uh, focus in on some of the changes. So in terms of our legislative uh, changes, we have the safety case regulations, which got amended. And then the other main piece of legislation is what's called the Prevention of Fire Explosion and the Emergency Response Regulations, called PAFIA. Um, they were changed as well. There was various other bits and changes to some of the other legislation as well to implement the various requirements of the directive. But largely, things stay the same from a legislative perspective. Um, so just to share some information on our experience, the competent authority, the Offshore Safety Directive Regulator, OSDR, set their stall out very on, early on to be uh, consultative and open with industry. So they wanted industry to be fully uh, engaged in the process and have buy-in to the changes that were going to be made to the, uh, the governing legislation. So they um, came with very clear timelines and commitments about how they would process and review some of the documentation submissions, so things like the safety case, they would commit to getting uh, early failed comments to the operator within two weeks if it was um, not going to pass any further scrutiny. They would commit to uh, issuing what's called non-acceptance issues, comments basically within 90 days. So it was very clear what the timeline, if you were an operator, when you would get information on the uh, success of your safety case, let's say. And they have similar processes for well operations notifications and the uh, uh, combined operations notifications as well, recognising that um, for drilling operations and well operations, uh, approval for the well ops notification is, a, is could be a critical path. So they were very open, very clear, uh, very keen to make sure industry were aware of their obligations and also the uh, timelines as well. Okay. Um, some of the general feedback. Uh, the regulator issued what's called the assessment templates, which started life as their own internal, um, let's say, route map of information. And they expected operators to fill these tables in as well to basically tell the regulator where the required information would be in their safety case or well operations notification. So that was quite useful. It was a good check to, to ensure um, compliance obligations were known and met. Um, the common theme from the regulator, the message to all operators was read the regulations, understand the requirements, make sure you're aware of your obligations. One of the new things that came into the North Sea uh, was the requirement to prepare a corporate major accident prevention policy. Um, this is the 
you know, the short one-page policy that's signed off by the highest levels in the organisation, the, the CEOs and the board, articulating their clear commitment to, to managing major accidents and uh, um, having a, an organisation that is committed for all the levels to managing these major accidents as well. Um, all in all, it's a policy, but the regulator's view is this was this was an opportunity for them to, to get absolute clarity that the most senior people in the organisation were clearly committed to the management of major accidents. And, you know, expectation was they would prepare this CMAP in consultation with their organisation and they would clearly sign off as well. So the content is, like any policy, quite short, but the real, um, the real value from a regulator's perspective was to, to get the most senior people in the organisation to clearly sign up and endorse control of major accidents. Um, requirement for operators to prepare and implement a safety and, safety and environmental management system. Most operators, all operators, had a health, safety, environmental management system. So this was required to be revised to, to meet some of the new requirements. Generally, from a safety case perspective, the regulator expected to see a little bit more information and a bit more detail about some of the management systems and processes. Um, New requirement that came in the directive that weaved its way into the North Sea was the requirement to address the environmental consequences of the major accidents, um, i.e. what's termed the major environmental incidents. So this is one area where there was probably a lot of debate and discussion and initially not very clear what was required as well. But the regulator was quite good last year surfacing, saying as far as they're concerned, major environmental incidents are resulted to uh, uh, um, a loss of well control from an eruptive, uh, flowing, free-flowing liquid well, um, or some failure of a, a static storage system of hydrocarbon liquids, so floating production storage offloading facility or floating storage unit. And there was a few of the criteria in there, to, the, the spill had to be, for it to be classed as a major environmental incident. The, the, the guidance from the environmental side of the competence authority was uh, no new assessments needed, draw upon the information in the environmental impact assessment and the oil pollution emergency plan as well. Um, also, there was the requirement for, within the safety case, to demonstrate the oil spill effectiveness of the arrangements in that particular location. Now, the UK tackled this on a, a, a sort of North Sea sector perspective, and there was guidance prepared which allowed operators to, to understand what the effectiveness was of the blend of oil spill arrangements for any particular season, for any location. So that um, was a good example of sort of collaboration between all the operators and the regulator to get that information done once. And, and it makes life very easy for describing this in the safety case. You go into that document, you, you understand where your installation is, and then you've got the information about how effective the different um, oil spill response strategies are for that location for each season. Um, and the other change was the, what were termed safety critical elements, those important pieces of hardware are now termed safety and environmental critical elements, and uh, all the operators had to do a review to check you know, new equipment was introduced by that requirement, which there was very little. Um, diving activities as well, I think it's probably fair to say in the North Sea, diving was neglected, it's always been in there and recognised as a major accident, and the diving specialists within our regulator were very, very keen to, to uh, see profile and awareness and the nature of the major accidents associated with diving clearly articulated and demonstrated within the safety case as well. And this is one which probably caught all operators out. Everybody had to do rework to address this. Um, and basically what they wanted to see was consideration of the hazards associated with diving as a connected activity. So if it was a diving support vessel, uh, stable on dynamic positioning adjacent to a platform for a period of two weeks. There's interaction hazards there that needed to be addressed. Uh, and again, the demonstration control of those. And they're also keen to see that installation-based diving, where the dive spread equipment is introduced onto a platform temporarily, was uh, considered. And they were particularly interested in how the temporary dive spread system could interact with the, the existing platform safety critical elements. So, the gas quads need fire protection tie-in, weight loadings, all those kind of things as well. Okay, uh, so I guess to summarise the main changes from a 
the safety case perspective was probably something like this. So if we assume this is a, a typical generic safety case structure, introduction, we had to introduce some commentary around uh, workforce engagement, how we'd actually engage the workforce within the development and implementation of rollouts of the safety case. Clear description of the operating boundaries, what diving activities we would and wouldn't do, what our operating envelope is in terms of production, process, temperatures, parameters, those kind of things. Um, clearly define the sensitive environmental receptors in the area, pull that information from the environmental impact assessment. Um, some tweaks to the HSE management system description, introducing the corporate major accident pre prevention policy and making sure the management system could deliver those commitments from the corporate major accident prevention policy. Um, introducing the requirement to assess the environmental consequences of the major accidents. So again, drawing on information from the oil pollution emergency plan and the environmental impact assessment, include diving. Um, emergency response, use the terminology internal emergency response for the platform or installation specific arrangements and clearly articulating how the internal emergency response dovetails with the national external emergency response. So again, we're, we were probably already 90% there. These changes were probably 10% to, uh, to what was required. Okay, last slide then. I thought it'd just be useful to, to share this statement then. So this is from Lord Cullen, who wrote the excellent um, investigation report into Piper Alpha, and he presented the Piper 25 conference uh, a few years back. And, and this statement really resonated with me. He said, some, some might be tempted to think that the preparation or revision of a safety case could be little more than a paper exercise to satisfy a regulatory body. You know, to my mind, that would be to misunderstand its purpose or value. So what he's saying is we could make this a tick, tick box exercise, um, but there's opportunities when developing and implementing a safety case to, for example, engage the workforce and the guys who really control the major accident hazards in the nature of those hazards and their roles and responsibilities. So, um, you know, Let's look for opportunities to do these things in a smart, effective, cost-efficient way with full engagement to the guys who actually manage these major accidents as well. Okay, thank you. That's all.